Simple Suburban Murder Tom and Scott Mystery Book 1 Author Mark Richard Zubro Publisher St. Martin's Press, New York Narrator Eric Ost For Kathy Chapter 7 I threw on a shirt and padded through the house. I didn't turn on any lights. Carefully I peered around the curtains that covered the picture window. I could make out a dim figure on the front doorstep. I felt Scott glide up behind me. Big help your security system is, I muttered. It's designed for break-ins, not someone knocking on the front door. I opened the curtain wider to get a better look. Be careful, he warned, then whispered. Can you see who it is? No, I whispered back. The person appeared small and slight. I think it's a kid. I paused. Whoever it is is alone. There could be others hiding in the dark. Scott sounded ominous. Let's call the police. It's a kid alone. I'm sure of it. I walked to the panel of switches from the outside lights and turned on the porch light. The pounding and ringing stopped. Scott in my place at the window said, It's Keith Evans. Immediately I opened the door and let him in. Scott turned on the living room lights. The kid looked awful. His hair was windblown and ragged. Mud covered his shoes and pants. His coat was torn. Even inside the house, he shivered. Without preliminaries, Keith blurted out, Phil called. He's in trouble. You've got to help. I said, Keith, start from the beginning and tell us what happened. A little before midnight, the phone rang. It was Phil, I interrupted. Where was your mom? I don't know. She left around 10.30 tonight. She didn't say anything about where she was going or when she'd be home. She wasn't back when the call came or when I left. Is that normal for her, I asked. It was real strange. Weren't you worried when she didn't come home? No, he shrugged. Should I be? I don't know, I said truthfully. This was a totally strange family. What did Phil say? I asked. He sounded real scared. He said to get to you, Mr. Mason. He said for you to come rescue him. Where was he? He didn't get a chance to say. Right in the middle of a word, the phone went dead. I'm scared, Mr. Mason. Where is he? Why is he in danger? What's going on? I ignored his questions for the moment and asked, Why did you call us? I looked on my dad's faculty list. Your address was there, but not your phone number. I tried the operator, but you were enlisted. Phil said it was an emergency and not to call the police. He sounded bad. I figured I'd better talk to you right away. I looked at your address. It didn't seem that far, so I decided to walk it. It was a lot further than I thought. How'd you get so dirty? Scott asked. On the way here, I kept tripping over stuff in the dark. I ran into fields or people's yards. Every time a car drove by because I didn't want somebody to report a kid walking around, I fell into the snow. I a couple of times when I jumped off the road. The storm the morning before had left a couple of inch taste of winter. Why not wait for your mom? Scott said. I was scared. I had to do something fast. Then he snorted contemptuously and looked away from us. My mom can't do nothing. She's a wimp. Easy, Keith, I said. She's your mom. You know we'll have to call her and tell her you're here. He hung his head. I reached for the phone. He mumbled the number. When I asked for it, it rang 12 times before one of the girls answered. I asked for Mrs. Evans. After a few minutes, she came back and said her mom wasn't home. I explained who I was and the reason for my call. She remembered me from our visit. She spoke in a scared whisper, but seemed to understand what I wanted. She agreed to leave a note for her mom, telling her where Keith was. I spent some time reassuring her. I urged her to go to bed, which seemed fatuous, but I didn't know what else to say. Then I hung up, wondering where Mrs. Evans was. I decided I couldn't waste time worrying about her. The main problem was Phil. Where the hell was he? I tried a few more questions on Keith. Did you get any clue at all from what your brother said that might give a hint about where he was? Keith furrowed his brow and thought a minute. I don't remember anything. If you could remember, even a small detail, I said. A background noise, a conversation, a TV, a stereo, maybe even outdoor noises. He thought again, then said, Sorry, nothing, only his voice. He gave us a plaintive look. Are you going to save him? We don't know where he is, I said gently. You've got to help him, Mr. Mason. He's in danger. I considered phoning the police to them. Phil was now only another runaway. 
further, I had no specifics to tell them. Only a cut-off phone conversation, as told by a 13-year-old. The only thing I could think of was Daphne's bar. I got the number from directory assistance and called. The noise on the other end was loud enough that Scott and Keith could hear it from where they sat. The womb must have been in high gear. My normal tone of, tone of voice produced no response. I tried shouting into the phone. Whoever was on the other end couldn't hear me. Even then, I yelled that I wanted to talk to Daphne. My words echoed around the living room. On the other end, the phone slammed down. I tried four more times with the same amount of success. Finally, all I got was a busy signal. If we wanted to rescue Phil that night, we'd have to drive down there and hope Daphne would talk. I told Scott. He agreed. Where are you going? Keith asked. A place that might give us a clue to where Phil is, I said. I want to come, Keith said. It's not an appropriate place for a 13-year-old, Scott said. I want to come. Keith was stubborn. Scott explained to Keith that it was too late for him to be up and out and that he needed to be in bed. Keith remained adamant. I decided the kid was in this deep enough and deserved a full explanation. I expected he might not understand all of it. He might lose respect for his brother. I knew for sure. I did not intend debating with a 13-year-old in the middle of the night. It wasn't up to me to protect that, the sacred familial sensibilities for him. Mr. and Mrs. Evans had destroyed them for Keith long ago. We went to finish dressing. I explained my reasoning to Scott. He looked surprised, but thankfully didn't argue. I let Scott tell the kid of the change in plans. Keith wore a shirt, pants, and socks of mine. The pants had to be rolled up a foot to keep him from tripping over the legs. A rope tied around the waist held them up. The shirt hung down to his knees. For, for a coat, he wore my old marine jacket. In the car, he sat between us. I explained everything I knew about Phil's situation to him. He accepted it all silently. At the end, his only question was, Because Phil's gay, does that mean I am? I told him no. Contented with that answer, he stared out the window at the passing lights. As we entered the Dan Ryan, from I-57, I could see him desperately trying to stay awake. By the time we exited the Lakeshore Drive on Fullerton, his yawns came more frequently. It was a couple of minutes before three. Keith stumbled out of the car. After us, when we parked, Scott started to protest, then swallowed it. Keith had seen this much. He might as well see the rest. The bouncer at the door tried to stop us. We're closed, and you can't bring that kid in here, he barked. Scott punched him. The guy plopped backwards, stunned. He sat shaking his head. We went in. The bar lights were up, revealing the scumminess the darkness usually concealed. Daphne stood in front of the bar, counting money. She wore an acre of pink chiffon. She looked up. Christ! You guys! Then she caught sight of Keith. What the fuck is this? A clown act? Even I don't take them this young. She glared at me. I told you before to stay away. I meant it. Get out. The bouncer had recovered and sidled up next to her. Marvin, how'd you let these assholes in here? She asked. He rubbed his jar where Scott hit him. He whined. I tried to stop them, but they got rough. Clarence, come here, Daphne called. The bartender from the other night appeared from a back room. He propped himself on the other side of Daphne. She announced to us, I want you out of here. You can leave by yourselves or we'll put you out. You have three seconds to decide. We need to find Phil, I said. He's not here. Get out. He's in trouble, Keith shouted. I don't care. Your three seconds are up. Dump them. She ordered, then added, but go easy on the kid. I planted my feet. Scott took a position next to me. Daphne, I said, I don't want to fight. We don't want trouble for you. But we stay until we get information. Do it now, she commanded. Throw them out. They came from opposite sides of the bar. They were bigger than Scott and I. The fight was brief. They were muscle-bound clods, more for decoration and scaring lonely old gay men than for real strength. Plus, Scott and I, battered as I was, were in better shape than they. A moment later, the two flunkies rested on the floor, one up against the bar, the other with a turned-over table as a cushion for his head. Daphne didn't join in the brawl. Scott and I breathed easily. My knuckles were sore, but that was all. 
Wow, Keith said. You guys are great. Shit, Daphne said. Fucking wimps. For a minute, I thought she might try attacking us herself. Shakely, Clarence, and Marvin pushed themselves off the floor. They eased slowly away from us. The fight was out of them. Should we call the police? Marvin asked. No, she snapped. You couldn't handle them, so I'll have to. She continued to eye us wearily for several moments. Finally, she heaved her massive shoulders in a thunderous shrudge. She waved the two of them away. She gave me a piercing look and said, What am I supposed to be, Mother Teresa for that whole family? Yes, Phil was here tonight. He left around 10.30. I haven't seen him since. His mother was in about 11.30, looking for him. She was here? That I wouldn't make up. How'd you know it was her, I asked. Honey, this mousy suburban looking woman stalked in here. She took one look and freaked, like this was all the circles of hell at once. But she stayed. Took a lot of guts. Mama looking for her young, I guess. She asked a few people about Phil. Before I could get off the bar and get to her, Marvin should have stopped her at the door, but he's new and not too bright. Probably thought it was the latest drag fashion. She asked me if I knew where Phil was. Did you tell her? I asked. No, she snarled. I'm not here to play nursemaid to fucked up families. She left abruptly and without learning anything. She wasn't home when we tried to call her a little while ago, I said. She didn't leave me her itinerary, Daphne responded. And you just threw her out, I said. She stabbed a finger at me. Look, buddy, I went out of my way to help you once. You've got all the nice you're going to get for me. I explained about the phone call. He could be in dangerous trouble, I concluded. Could be, she agreed. You helped us before, Scott said. You knew how to get hold of him then. Why not help us? Then and now are two different things, she said. It's not worth my place here or my living to go further. Suddenly, she looked annoyed with herself. I've helped enough and I have work to do. She eyed me carefully, almost kindly. I thought she said why don't you get the hell out go back to your safe suburb forget phil he's where all lost pretty young boys go in this city he'll be better off there abruptly i said let's go something she said had started me thinking in the car scott asked why'd we give up if we stayed a year we wouldn't get any more out of her i said she let it slip that there was someone behind her Someone who I think has a strong hold over her. Who? Scott asked. I have no idea. What about Phil? Keith asked. He wasn't there, obviously, I said. And there was no way we could get the information out of them. Couldn't you guys beat them up and make them? Keith asked. I suppressed a smile. We're not equipped for extensive torture, I told him. He subsided. What's next? Scott asked. I drove for a while in silence. The lights of the loop glittered majestically as we drifted southward on Lakeshore Drive's new S-curve. I waited until we drove past McCormick Place onto the Stevenson Expressway before I answered. I want to try and get into the computer program again. Something Daphne said gave me an idea. What did she say? Something about where all lost young boys go in the city. And I remember when we heard about the escort service that specializes in young guys. But we got nowhere with that phone call. What would Jim Evans have to do with it anyway? Maybe nothing. But what if there is a connection? Remember, Neil said there was. If my idea doesn't work, I haven't lost anything. If it does, then I think we're a lot closer to catching the real murderer. It was after four. Besides the lack of sleep, I was still worn out from the beating. I noticed Keith. He'd fallen asleep while we were on Lakeshore Drive. He slept with his head resting peacefully on Scott's shoulder. It was after five when we got home. Keith was sound asleep. Scott carried him into the house. He put him on the couch and covered him with a blanket. Keith stirred briefly, then went back to sleep. I called Mrs. Evans. She answered this time. She sounded exhausted, but even taking that into account, she seemed curiously uninterested in what I had to say about Keith and Phil. When I asked questions about her whereabouts, she was totally uncommunicative. I didn't pursue it. I planned to talk to her after school. I told her we'd be there at 4.30. She dithered about it, but agreed when I pushed her. Scott and I sat down at the computer. I inserted the disc, turned on the computer. We watched the preliminary data print on the screen. 
The question then appeared that I hadn't been able to get beyond for days. Identification code? The cursor blinked on and off, waiting for my response. I typed in Adonis at large. The screen cleared, the disk drive hummed, then the three most dreaded words of the computer age flashed on the screen. File not found. I pounded the table softly. Shit! I thought, that was it. Scott spoke comfortingly. You've given it a good try. I glanced out the window. The winter, winter darkness held on. I returned a baleful stare to the computer screen. I was depressed. Scott rested a hand on my shoulder. Maybe after you've had some sleep, you can try again. He said, I shook my head. I'm not going to be able to sleep. I was angry and irritated and worried about Phil. I thumped the computer screen with my finger. I want to work at this a little longer. Okay, he said. I'll make us some coffee. I returned to the computer screen. I stared at the three little hyphenated words. There had to be some combination that worked to give me the information. Evans had stored it a mindless exercise. I tried pressing one key at a time, starting at the top. Maybe it was in those words and a simple combination of keys. I must have been truly tired if it was random. Then my punching was hopeless. I came to the caps lock key and it dawned on me. I shouted in excitement. I also felt like a fool. One of the simplest maneuvers and I missed it. They teach it to elementary school kids. If you type in your access code ALL in capital letters, you've got to type ALL CAPITALS to retrieve it. Scott appeared in the doorway. What? he asked. This has got to be it, I said. I typed in Adonis at large. Once again, the screen cleared. The disk drive word. Beautiful green letters began to dance across the screen. You got it, Scott exclaimed. It was all there, data from the gambling and the math department, records for Adonis at large, even what Elvin Evans held over Armstrong and Sylvester's head. We studied the figures. It took almost an hour to go through it all. We went back over the high points. Vance lied. Evans ran the gambling operation. Maybe Evans didn't control it at the beginning, but he did before he died. I tapped the computer screen. Look at this. A list of faculty members with the amounts owed Evans appeared. Some as low as $50. Vance owed 9500 Plenty enough to kill for, Scott commented. And maybe Evans was short this kind of money to someone else. And he may have had gambling debts of his own. The evidence for this was less clear. Someone owed somebody over $20,000. It had to be Evans, but who'd he owed it to? We examined the records for Adonis at large. Some listings were only names, but most included phone numbers, dollar amounts, and addresses, or at least an indication of a region in the metropolitan area. All had listed their sexual interest. These are clients, I said. Under southwest suburbs, Armstrong's name appeared. Moments later, Sylvester showed up. Holy shit, Scott said when he saw their names. A second list began. I recognized some of the names of former students. These names are by types. They would service... Here's the males for males. I pressed the advanced arrow. The males for females. I pressed it again and females for males. I saw Greg's sister's name. I pressed the button once more. The last list had females for females. Armstrong and Sylvester were customers of Sheila's, I guessed. That's why she called. That's got to be it, Scott said. I examined the second list. Next to the names were physical characteristics. Age, weight, height, color of hair and eyes. None was over 25. One as young as 14. Evans was a pimp and not a cheap one. He kept a large percentage of each whore's take to keep them from making enough money to get big ideas. The costs were next to the names. The lowest was $100 for an hour. The 14-year-old was a girl for $5,000. A night, I felt sick. Scott said, Evans was a fucking creep. Yeah, I agreed. You know this is dangerous information, Scott said. You're right. Whoever is in charge of Adonis at large must know Evans had this information. They must want it back. Maybe Evans was in charge. Maybe, but I don't think that was his style. He leached from others, certainly an operation this big, has others involved. Maybe this is what they broke into the Evans' house looking for. 
I pressed the arrow to run the information again. I hoped it would give some clue we'd missed as to who was in this with Evans. But checking the whole entry gave no hint of whom this might be. Whoever it was, I also suspected it was the one Evans owed money to. If there is somebody else, maybe Neil would know, Scott suggested. I'll try him later. I looked at the end of the program thoughtfully. I had a grim thought. You know what else bothers me, I said. What? he asked. Daphne's comment made me think of this. Remember when she said, where all pretty young men go? And that's how Neil described Adonis at large. The other day, lots of pretty young men. If Evans was part of the operation, he peddled his own kid. Nobody could be that vile, Scott said. And wait, Phil didn't say anything like that. Maybe he didn't know his dad was behind it. I ran the information back, searching for Phil's name. It wasn't there. So he wasn't part of the group, Scott concluded. I shrugged. Maybe not, or maybe Phil just became part of the group since he left home. The last set of information on Sylvester and Armstrong revealed the connection among the three of them. They had been skimming money from athletic events, as Meg had suggested. The how and why I wasn't sure yet. I was determined to find out at school that day. I told Scott my plan. Shouldn't you take all this to the police, he objected. You forget they have a copy. You know what I mean. Okay. They probably haven't broken into the program yet. We were in the bedroom. I talked a while. I undressed for a quick shower. I'll tell you what I'll do. After we've talked to Mrs. Evans after school, we'll go straight to the police station. He looked dissatisfied. I went on quickly. Before I leave, I'll make another copy of the disc. Plus, I want to run copies on the printer. I'll need one for school. I jumped into the shower. We can mail one copy to your place and one here. That way, the information will be in many places and available to us if someone decides to get nasty. They've already gotten nasty, he pointed out. You were there to rescue me? I opened the shower curtain and grinned at him. Barely, he grumbled. And I still think we should tell the police now. After school, I promise... Scott wrote Keith a note in case he woke up while we were gone. We left with one disc and two printouts. I left one disc at home for Scott to examine during the day. We mailed the printouts on the way to school. Scott looked worried all the while he drove. I gave his hand a reassuring pat. Everything will be all right. I wouldn't miss this day at school for the world. I can't wait to meet with Armstrong and Sylvester. It's time to push the bullies around a little. I wish this was over with and we were out of it, he said. We didn't ask to be in it, I replied. What about Phil, he asked. I don't know. I'm worried, but I can't think of what we could do. We could try Greg's sister. We didn't get too far with her before. But I'm willing to give it another try. She should be able to give us a lead on the escort service. Scott planned to pick me up at school after staying with Keith all day. Together, the three of us would go see Mrs. Evans. I was to call Scott immediately if there was a problem with the administrators. As I got out, he told me to be careful. I promised I would. The first thing I did was go to the school office. I asked Georgette to tell Armstrong and Sylvester I wanted to see them in my classroom at noon. Tell them? She gasped faintly. Yes, Georgette. She gaped at me. What if they're busy? Tell them they need to cancel it, or they can cancel their careers. If they were sufficiently angry and off balance when they showed up, I might be able to get solid information out of them. Between classes, I borrowed a computer from Meg. I filled her in briefly on the latest and told her I'd give her the details later. All morning, I half expected one or the other of them to come down or send a message, refusing the meeting. It's seldom that job-threatening conversations occur in the school system, and even rarer for the teacher to be the one doing the threatening. For a fleeting moment, I let myself enjoy the irony of the situation. Around 11, I found myself a little tired. I shook it off. I hoped to be through with the Evans family, the administration, and the murder by the end of the day. At noon, they showed up. Sylvester's shallow face now had red blotches I'd never seen before. He rubbed his hands together in nervous bursts. Armstrong gave me a look that combined condescension with benign puzzlement. He said, If you wanted to see us, it wasn't necessary to terrorize a poor, lowly secretary. 
a simple request would have been quite sufficient. He attempted what I supposed he thought was a wise fatherly smile. To me it looked vinegary and pained. I said, gentlemen, I have some information for you. It should clarify a lot of the problems we've had around here. I have a meeting in 10 minutes, Armstrong said, so if you could be quick about it. I flipped the computer on. I invited them to join me in viewing the screen. Oh no, Sylvester moaned as he realized what it was. He sat down heavily into one of the students' desks, covering his face with his hands. Armstrong decided to brave it out. I can't imagine what you think this jumble of dates and dollar amounts means, he said to me. Obviously, this is something Jim Evans dreamed up. You can't imagine we have anything to do with the random actions of a man who isn't here to explain whatever it is you think you have here. I never mentioned Jim Evans, I said. Sylvester's moan increased in depth and despair. Shut up, Armstrong barked at him. He turned to me. This is obviously some trick of yours to ruin us or get back at us. It won't work. We know you're gay. If this information comes out about us, we'll tell the world about you. All of this suave condescension was gone. I kept my voice deadly calm. That didn't work Tuesday. It won't work today. I'm still not impressed by your threats. You should know that the police have this data disk with this information on it. Then why haven't they talked to us? Armstrong asked quickly. I figured out the access code. Only this morning. I haven't given it to the police yet, but I intend to. What can we do to stop you? Sylvester asked. You're a cheap blackmailer like Evans, Armstrong accused. No, I said. I'm trying to solve the murder. I want you to tell me the whole story. What hold did Evans have over you two? I knew Scott would be angry at my next promise, but I felt it was necessary. If you tell me, I won't give the police the access code. Forget it, Armstrong snapped. You're not to be trusted. It was all so simple at first, Sylvester began. Shut your stupid mouth, Armstrong roared at him. That's all I've been to you these years. You're a stupid dupe. Can't you see it's all going to come out? I'll lose my job, Sylvester pointed at Armstrong. And so will you. It won't come out if we stick together, Armstrong pointed at me. What can he do? He's only a school teacher. But Sylvester was a broken man. His body sagged and drooped around the student desk. He tried to reason with Armstrong. The police will find out about all this. We're going to be implicated in the murder. If we talk now, it might go easier for us. We haven't done anything, Armstrong insisted. Sylvester turned to me. I know I had nothing to do with the murder. Absolutely nothing. I want that clear. Meaning I did, Armstrong said. I don't know. Did you? Sylvester responded. You son of a bitch. Armstrong swung his arm to hit his employee. Sylvester didn't flinch. I seized the arm on the backswing. Armstrong turned to me. You think you're so high and mighty, he began. Sylvester cut him off. Jason, it's time to drop it. His voice was weary. Armstrong leaned over Sylvester. The police already have a suspect. He flapped his arm in my direction. They won't listen to him. Don't say anything stupid. Sylvester waved his boss away and looked up at me. While Sylvester explained, Armstrong strode to the window and contemplated the world outside. Sylvester said, Six years ago, I needed money. I was getting divorced. I'd gotten my mortgage. When interest rates were out of sight. There were other things, too. It doesn't matter what. I was desperate. It all seemed so simple. For years, they trusted me with counting the receipts from all school events. It was a practice left over from 15 or 20 years ago, when this was a little farm district and one man ran the whole operation. He sighed heavily. So I started skimming money. At first, it was small amounts, a hundred a week from the football games. It turned out it was incredibly easy during basketball season. There was a lot more money. No one kept count of how many people showed up at the games. It was a poor month when I didn't get an extra thousand. Then I got caught. He jerked his thumb at Armstrong. I don't know how he did it. I was so careful not to let the numbers fluctuate too much. The baseball team won all its home games that year. Crowds were enormous. He came to my office late one night after a basketball game. Maybe he was suspicious before then. I don't know. I'm certain he never intended to turn me in. 
Instead, he had one of his oily proposals. I had to go along. He gave me a look that appealed for sympathy. I sat on the edge of my desk, prepared to listen to the rest. He went on. I was to continue skimming money. He would take half. I had to go on taking risks. The next year, I was in better financial shape, and I wanted to stop. He told me we would keep on, that if I tried to stop, he'd turn me in. I said he'd be fired, too. He laughed at me and dared me to quit. I couldn't chance it. I needed the job. Sylvester snuffled. He fished for a handkerchief, found none. He wiped his nose and face on his coat sleeve. He's a greedy bastard. That's what wrecked it. We kept on and Evans found out about it. How? I asked. Some stupid assignment he gave the kids in math class. It was a group of slow kids. He told them to count how many kids fit in each bleacher section of the gym. Some stupid thing like that. One of the goddamn kids got hold of one of those counter things. He sat at the door counting every kid who walked in the gym. This way, he wouldn't have to count the kids in each section. He could simply divide the total by the number of sections, and that's easier than trying to count each section, with all the kids constantly moving around. Futilely, he fished for a handkerchief again, before he abused his sleeve once more. I handed him a tissue from the box on my desk. I gave him a minute, then prodded. So, the kid got an accurate count. Yes, later Evans told us he was the only kid who completed the assignment, along with extra credit, which was to multiply the number of kids by the price of admission. Evans remembered the assignment. It was the only one the kid turned in all year. Evans remembered the totals, too. Besides being a math teacher, Evans had an incredible memory for statistics. When the student paper, as it always does, printed the amount of the gate receipts, Evans noticed a discrepancy. For several games, he sat with a counter. When the disparity happened consistently, he figured illegal activity was in progress. He came to me with it. I refused to face him alone. I brought him to Armstrong. We worked out a deal. Evans would get a percentage for five years. I've paid the price. My health is shot. My stomach is in shreds, and I'm the one who counts the money. I'm the one they'll blame. Armstrong turned and faced us. No one will do anything if you keep your mouth shut. I won't th let them pin a murder charge on me. No one said anything about murder, Armstrong said. The police will, I countered. They'll see blackmail as a good motive for murder. He walked over to me. And what makes you a big deal know-it-all? Remember, I said, I'm just a school teacher. I'll drag you down with us, Armstrong threatened. I'm not worried about me. I know I didn't kill him. Armstrong glared at me. I turned to Sylvester and asked, Where were you the night of the murder? Home with my wife, he said simply. He'd remarried three years ago. I turned back to the superintendent. And where were you, Mr. Armstrong? I don't have to answer your goddamn questions. He gave me an evil stare. I gazed calmly back. Finally, his eyes dropped. Sylvester said, You might as well know the rest. We were in the gambling operation, too. He waved a hand in Armstrong's direction. He met with Evans that night to pay everything. You goddamn son of a bitch. This time I wasn't quick enough to stop him. Armstrong belted Sylvester in the mouth with the back of his hand. Sylvester's head rocked back. His nose began to bleed. Armstrong swung around to me. He snarled. Yes, I met Evans to pay what we owed him. What time was this? About 12.30. Why then? That's when he said to meet him. I think he enjoyed making things inconvenient and uncomfortable for people. You paid what you owed, and I left. I swear he was alive and sitting in the restaurant parking lot when I left him. How did your gambling get started, I asked. He insisted we join his gambling operation. He made it part of the price we had to pay for his silence. Did you know any of the details of the operation? No, not really, Armstrong said, only that he handled everything. Tell the rest of it, Sylvester said. About that night, Armstrong gave him a dirty look. All right, along with paying him, I told him we wouldn't gamble anymore. These past two months, we lost more money from the gambling than we took in from skimming off money. What did he say to your refusal to pay? He said he'd expose us if we failed to come across, as usual, the next week. He died before we found out if it was a bluff or not. 
I didn't kill him, Sylvester reiterated. I was at home. Did you kill him? I asked Armstrong. He sat on top of the desk next to Sylvester. He gazed up at me. I don't expect you to believe me, but no, I didn't kill him. I might have during that week sometime. Some lucky guy got there ahead of me. I dropped my next question innocently into the conversation. And you were customers of the escort service. Only once, only once, Sylvester said. She was over 18. I made sure of that. After the fact, Armstrong sneered. I didn't even know it was a former student until afterwards, Sylvester said. You had sex with her too, he added. That's why she called you, I said. Once you were caught in Evan's web, it only got worse. Armstrong said, During the day, I made another decision. After school, I spoke to Greg. I talked to him about going to see his sister with us. He agreed to come along. I hoped his presence would convince her to tell us more. We'd pick him up later. I called Murphy. He didn't think they'd reopen the case, but he would keep trying. I wanted to tell about Armstrong's meeting with Evans, but... I'd promised them, slime as they were, I wouldn't break my promise to them. At least for now. If I couldn't prove Vance didn't do it in a day or so, I'd have to. I asked Murphy if I could talk to Vance. He said he'd try to arrange it. When I got in the car, Keith moved to the back seat. I slept until 1.30. Keith announced, I'm envious, I told him. He picked up the stereo earphones in the back seat. Do these work? he asked. Scott adjusted the system for backseat headset listening. Scott's car radio system is better than most people's home systems. As Scott drove, I filled him in on the big confrontation. I spoke low to be sure Keith couldn't hear even with his earphones on. I was annoyed at Scott's initial reaction. He said, So you won't give the police the access code? I promised them if they told me I wouldn't. What about your promise to me? I'm sorry, I wanted their information. And what about the other stuff on the disc? What about all those kids being used as prostitutes, he demanded. Are you going to tell about that? Yes, I'm going to tell about that. Fine, when, he was angry. Soon, each minute you delay, another kid is hurt, probably scared, scarred for life. Will you ease off? I didn't apply for the position of God here. We were lucky. We found the key to the whole operation. The police have the data. They haven't helped us. I'm not ready to help them. Think of the kids. He was still angry. Those on that list have been doing prostitution for a long time. Even with our immediate intervention, there's little we could do. We could stop it. How? If we told the cops and they do what? Arrest the kids. Yeah, so. And it would stop. For how long? This held him silent for a minute. They could return them to their parents, he said finally. These kids, or most of them, don't want to be with their parents. Long ago, they could have returned to them. They didn't. I pointed my finger at him. Or their parents don't want them. I agree we need to tell the police. My view is that it isn't as immediate an issue as you think it is. Say I agree to that. When you decide to give the information to the police, how will you keep from giving them the stuff about Armstrong and his buddy? I don't know. Are you sure you've got a hold of yourself on this? Yes, I said flatly. I want to find the murderer. The police can't or won't. I found the body. I've been shot at and beaten up. I won't give in. Tell me if I'm wrong and how I'm handling this. If you want, turn the car around right now. We'll go straight to the police station. Without a word, he pulled the car to the side of the road. He jammed the gear shift into neutral. You can't park here, I said, staring straight ahead. Look at me, he commanded. I did. His eyes searched mine, troubled and concerned. Very softly, he said, When you get stubborn, you take yourself far away. I'm not being... He cut off my denial. Yes, you are. You've got one thing in your head, finding the murderer. But you're making decisions you can't have as much confidence in as you pretend. I opened my mouth to retort, but he said, Let me finish, please. Several drivers beat their horns as they pulled around us. The shoulder was narrow and we were only half off the road. I glanced back at Keith. He listened on the earphones contentedly. The quiet thrum of Scott's angry voice filled the car. Look, Tom, I don't disagree with what you've done. You're angry, so am I. You want to find the killer, so do I. We both want to protect those kids. 
fine. I disagree with the order you have for solving this. I disagree with your protecting Sylvester and Armstrong. Your reasons are probably right, and I know you promised them. All of that's fine. But I've got a right to state my objections without you becoming so god-awful stubborn. That is not okay. That kind of stubbornness shuts me out, and I don't like it when you distance yourself from me like that. I listened to him. I watched his serious blue eyes. I saw the concern there. He'd called me on my stubbornness before. He was right. I got hold of my pride. I eased a couple of deep breaths in and out to give myself time to cool down. I'm sorry, Scott. You're right. I got carried away. I gazed at him evenly. He smiled gently. Okay. We'll be all right. We resumed our trip to the Evans's house. After repeated knocking, Mrs. Evans answered the door, hair uncombed and makeup awry. She led us to the living room. Keith, still tired from last night's adventure, wandered upstairs without argument. I'm sorry Keith has been such trouble, she said softly and lifelessly. He's been no trouble, Scott said. She folded her hands in her lap and stared at them. She looked lost and defeated. I questioned her about her activities the night before. She didn't answer. My questions. Instead, she plucked dispiritedly at the sleeve of her dress. She said, My husband is dead. My oldest boy is gone. My family is lost. She continued speaking without expression or gesture. I'm a rotten mother. Mrs. Evans, I said. You've been under an awful strain. We realize that. We want to help. Yes, help, she echoed plaintively. I tried again. Mrs. Evans, what made you go hunting for Phil last night? To a continued silence, I said, How did you know to go looking in that bar? Everybody thought I didn't know anything. Half the time they treated me like I didn't exist. Who? Mrs. Evans? Everyone. My husband. Phil. Even Keith nowadays. But I listened to everything. I could. I heard things. I was afraid to press her, but I wanted any information she had. How did you hear? I asked. Oh, on the phone. On the extension. I was confused. You did this last night? No. When my husband was alive. When Phil was here. What did you find out when you listened? Everything I knew my husband was an evil criminal. All of it. All the illegal stuff? Scott was incredulous. All. The prostitution? The gambling? He continued. All is all, she said simply. Now he was mad. How could you keep silent? He demanded. She shrugged. You weren't here. You don't didn't know what it was like. There was nothing that could be done. I said, Mrs. Evans, you claim to have secretly known what your husband was up to. In effect, you snuck around gathering knowledge to no effective purpose. Yes, she whispered. Why didn't you tell all this to the police? I asked. Her voice became even softer. I couldn't. I shook my head. Listen, Mrs. Evans, now you expect us to believe that somehow last night this magic knowledge led you to one particular gay bar. That's part of it, she answered. And what's the other part? What made you go looking last night? There was a call. From whom? He didn't say. I gritted my teeth. What did he say? If you want to see Phil, you better come quick. And then he told you where to go. Yes. What time was the call? Around 10.30. You went by yourself? Yes. Going to one bar doesn't take all night. I didn't find him there, so I searched. Where? I found one of those little magazines in that first bar that gives the addresses of gay places. I went up and down the streets. Clark, Halstead, Broadway, all those, yes, and more. You went in all those gay bars? Every one that was open. Every one that would let me in. All night you did this? Yes. Why didn't you ask for help? From who? You asked me once, and you didn't bring Phil back. You withheld a great deal of information that could have helped me the first time you asked. Mrs. Evans, you don't make sense to me. She responded in her softest tone yet. The whole world doesn't make sense to me. We sat and listened to time past. She didn't break down sobbing or go to pieces. She simply said, It's all quite useless. Do as you wish. Take my children, my home, my life. I give up. I wasn't about to relieve her alone in this state. Before we left, I called Heather Delacroix. Quickly, I explained the situation to her. She promised to come over to handle the immediate problems of the Evans household. 
We waited for her to show up, then left. We drove to Greg's house and picked him up. I introduced him to Scott. Scott's $50,000 sports car may have impressed him as much as meeting Scott. I explained everything to him about Phil's situation and the status of the Evans family. He seemed genuinely concerned about Phil's plight. I also told him about his sister and the disc. He didn't act too surprised about his sister's occupation. I asked him about this. She never told me, he said, but I sort of guessed. Mostly, I tried not to think about it. Who wants to admit his sister, he paused, does what she does, he finished. At first, his sister wouldn't let us in. It was Greg's pleading that got us past the door. In the living room, she sat more silent than a stone Buddha, but far less serene. First, Greg tried to get her to give us information about the escort service. She ignored him. After several minutes of this, I, I made my plea for help. She didn't react to me. Instead, she turned on Greg. Why'd you come with them, she said. I'm worried about Phil, he answered. Was he your lover? No. Then what do you care? He was my friend, Greg looked at us helplessly. Phil could be in a lot of danger, I said. We need the name and address of whoever ran Adonis at large with Jim Evans. She snorted contemptuously at me. We know you worked for him and you lied when you said you didn't know about the computer disk when we were here last. We found your name along with many others on the disk. Then why don't you go ask them? They would be at least as reluctant as you and far more surprised and threatened. That isn't my problem. Come on, Sheila, Greg pleaded. Be reasonable. I am being reasonable. I got my freedom and my livelihood from Jim Evans and his service. I got out of the house. I've got my own place, a life of my own. But you're a whore, Greg said. That's right, little brother. Her answer was surprisingly mild. It's not right, Greg insisted. And what is? She demanded quickly. He opened his mouth to answer, but none came. He flapped his arm on the chair in defeat. I tried another tack. You lied to us the first time we were here. You said you broke off with Evans three years ago. I didn't lie, she said. I stopped screwing him three years ago. I never stopped working for him. You didn't ask the right questions. If I ask the right questions now, will I get the truth? I doubt it. Her complacency infuriated me. Greg said, Sheila, I'm scared for Phil and for you. For the first time, a slight softness crept into her voice. There was even a ghost of a smile on her lips. She said, There's nothing to be frightened of, Greg. Then why won't you help? It's my income, Greg. It's how I live. From another room came the sounds of a waking baby. Sheila began to stand up, but Greg stopped her. I'll get him, he said. He returned with the child, cradled confidently in his arms. He smiled at us shyly, and he sat down next to his sister. I babysit all the time. His teenage gawkiness had disappeared. Sheila smiled at the two of them. For a moment, all the tension evaporated from the room. Scott interrupted this domesticity. Greg babysat while you went out to turn tricks. Greg looked crestfallen. Sheila swore. The phone rang. She went into the kitchen to answer it. To answer it. We couldn't hear the conversation. She was only a minute and a half. We heard her hang up, but she didn't return for five minutes. When she came back, she had changed from her old blue jeans and t-shirt top to a dress that clung so tight that the outline of her panties was clear underneath. She wore no bra. She had her winter jacket with her. Greg, could you sit tonight? She asked. Sure, he said dumbfounded. The baby was already asleep in his arms. Your friends are welcome to stay as long as you want them to. Sheila, I called to her retreating figure, but she slammed the door. We listened to her receding steps. I'm sorry, Greg said. She's really a great person, honest. I glanced rapidly around the living room. Maybe there's some clue in the apartment, I said. Greg began a protest, but I was up and moving. Scott followed, burdened with the baby. Greg was too slow to stop us. How much opposition he'd have shown, I don't know. His feelings seemed torn. I gave a brief word of assurance to him as I started to hunt. We searched all the rooms besides the living room. There were only the kitchen, bedroom, and bathroom. 
Greg followed us, watching from the doorways. After 30 minutes, we came up empty. We'd even found the do dope hidden in a fake frozen orange juice can in the refrigerator freezer. Finally, we stood in the bedroom, looking at each other helplessly. I'm sorry, you guys, Greg said. He still held the baby. I ran my back over the room. Green wallpaper hung on the wall. The floor was bare wood. The bed had no headboard. The blanket was thin and patched. The dresser showed signs of several poorly done refinishing jobs. The only bit of color was the baby's crib. I held up the tiny mattress of the crib, idly thunking it against the dresser. It's hopeless, I said. Is that something? Greg asked. Where? I asked. He pointed at the back of the mattress. That's the do not remove under penalty of whatever tag, Scott said. No, on the back of it, Greg said. I'd only glanced at the label. Now I looked more closely. Inked to the back of it was a list of names, addresses, and phone numbers. Clients, Scott guessed. Maybe, but look at these. I indicated the bottom two listings. What about them? Scott asked. They're the only ones without a name and not in the Joliet area, I said. Maybe they're special clients, Scott said. Possibly, but look again at the addresses. This one with the line through it is the Evans's address in Monkina. I'm almost certain. Now look at this address underneath it on Orland Street in Chicago. It's in separate color ink, Greg asked. What does that mean? I examined the addresses again. I mulled over the possibilities for several minutes. Then I said, I think it was added recently, probably since Evans' death. I bet it's her new contact. Now look at the address itself. That's this year's trendy section of the city, from the Merchandise Mart north to Chicago Avenue, and east from the river to Lake Michigan. And I think this is the address of the art gallery of John North, an extremely wealthy gay artist, bar owner, and activist. He lives in this gargantuan three-story house that's wedged between two high-rises. I pointed the block out to you, Scott, the last time we came home from Carson's Ribs. I think I remember, Scott said. I'm sure of it. In the old house, the art gallery is the first two floors. He lives above it. I ripped off the label. Leaving Greg there, we drove to the city. We can't just barge in there, Scott said as we drove through the November night. Yes, we can, I said. I think those two addresses are connected. My guess is Evans and North were in this together. That's a hell of a stretch of imagination. It's all we've got. His okay sounded fatalistic. What I want to know, I said, is who called Mrs. Evans? And I also want to know what happened between that call and the one Keith received from Phil. There's over an hour gap. That is unexplained, and I want to know why the person called. You don't want much, Scott said. If I can answer those questions, we'll be able to find Phil, and I bet be a long way to finding the murderer. You think there's a connection? Between the murderer and the kid's disappearance? Yeah. If you'd asked me that a couple of days ago, I'd have said no. Now I'm almost certain there is. We'll find it. Later, as we drove onto the Ohio Street off-ramp, Scott said, I'm surprised at the number of lies you and I have been told. I'm not, I replied. They all want to protect themselves. I think it's fairly normal. For my money, the Ohio Street off-ramp at night offers the most beautiful view of Chicago's skyline. It led directly to the section of town we wanted. Even on a Thursday night, there were lines of people trying to get into Ditka's. Ed Debevich's and the Hard Rock Cafe. We had to park six blocks away and walk back. A couple of quick hot dogs from a sidewalk vendor provided us with dinner. We arrived at the house. Turrets and battlements jutted from odd corners. Bay windows and cupolas existed at strange angles. The thing had obviously been built in sections, none of which matched. Cars swished toward the Ontario Street on ramp to the Kennedy Expressway. As we examined the building, a faint glow from a third floor window was the only sign of life. John North, the owner, was the most up and coming artist and photographer in town. Last January, one of the papers declared him this year's Renaissance man, 
He was the cutting edge of trendiness. He was gay. He occasionally dined to appear at fundraisers for gay community events, staying long enough to captivate the prettiest boy there, and then leaving. He was a strikingly handsome man in his late 20s. The world was at his feet. The dishier parts of my information came from Neil. He hated him. Despite repeated promises, North hadn't shown up at an important fundraiser Neil had organized. Neil neither forgave nor forgot. There was no downstairs bell to ring, only the closed glass doors through which we could see some of his latest constructions. Banging on the doors brought no response. This is useless. Let's try the back, I said. The alley that led to the back was unlit shadows upon shadows flowing back into the deeper dimness. As we walked further and garbage spilled and scrunched underfoot, we heard vermin and critters hurry away at our approach. An occasional pair of eyes glared insolently from a garage heap before winking out. A wooden gate gave entry to the backyard of the house. We slipped inside. I closed the gate. The latch clicked. The backyard was a jumble of six-foot evergreens and taller, more distant trees, broken bits of sidewalk, poked at our feet as we tiptoed down the narrow path to the back porch. The chill November wind whistled above us, crackling the barren tree branches. Together in the closeness of the backyard, sheltered by the evergreens, I could feel only the faintest traces of a breeze on my cheek. Total darkness emanated from the rear of the house. A porch ran the length of the back of the house. I put a foot on the bottom step. Scott put a hand on my sleeve to stop me. We're going to get caught, his voice was low. No, we aren't. I, too, kept my voice down. I'm glad you're confident. What if someone catches us? I thought six-foot-four baseball heroes didn't get scared. I'm not scared, he whispered fiercely. I'm worried, that's all. Don't be. Where I got these calm assurances, I don't know. My armpits overflowed with sweat. We ascended the creaking and crumbling stairs. We stopped at the vague outline of the back door. Do we knock? Scott whispered sarcastically. Why are we whispering? I whispered. It's spooky back here, and we don't belong. That's why. Scott spoke next to my ear, or I wouldn't have heard him. We knocked, or rather banged at the front door. I said in an almost normal vo voice. We'll simply knock, I raised my arm to do so. A laughing and singing group turned into the alley. I stood absolutely still. What if they're coming here? Scott's whisper was angry. As they drew closer, several of their voices became distinct. Their obvious drunken state did not comfort me. Their movement down the alley proceeded at a glacial pace. They stood outside the gate for an eternity. I held my breath. The gate clicked open. Scott grabbed me. Prepared, I supposed to sprint bullishly through them. Instead, I wrenched him back into the deeper darkness of the porch, corner furthest from the alley. I almost pulled him too hard. We nearly toppled off the edge. The group walked swiftly now. They ascended the porch. The darkness, their good spirits, and their gentle state of inebriation kept us hidden. I listened to one of them fumble with a key in the lock. The door opened. A moment later, a light sprang on in the house. I could see there were five of them, bundled up as they were. I didn't recognize any of them. When are the rest going to get here? The last one asked as he entered. A couple of minutes, came a deep voice reply from inside the house. They went to park their cars. The door creaked shut. I found myself breathing for the first time in a forever. Let's get the hell out of here, Scott rasped. No, I want to see what's going on. If there are a lot of people showing up, we could simply join the throng. You're nuts. These people know each other. I shushed him. I looked through a gap in the curtains in the window next to us. It was an entry room. After hanging up coats and scarves, the five of them quickly passed through a further door and out of sight. They left the light on. The gate clicked open again. Another group of five or six walked in. I could see them more clearly from the lights. The first group had left on. In a rush, it dawned on me that they would be able to see us, too. Scott gave a low moan. I assumed he had the same thought. What luck, finding a parking place so close, one of them said. 
I threw my arms around Scott and locked him in a fierce embrace. He started to protest, but I covered his mouth with my lips. His stifled mumble ended as he realized my plan. Heavy footsteps ascended the porch. Look at those two, someone tittered. How decadent, another added. The door creaked open. They stomped into the house. The last man stuck his head back out the door. You guys will freeze your asses off out there. Better come in before the rest of the crowd gets here. If you want to be up close. Thanks, I mumbled. Whoever it was went in. Scott broke the embrace. Let's leave. Let's go in. You're crazy. We were invited. He thought we were one of them. There'll probably be a crowd, he said, so we can get lost among them. I tried to give my words a confidence and reasonableness I'm not sure I felt. We've seen ten, maybe eleven guys at most, Scott said. Phil could be in some kind of danger in there. Fine, call the police. After all this, your continued faith in the regular constabulary continues to amaze me. Remember, they don't want to reopen the case. We heard another group coming down the alley. We'll look just as suspicious walking out past them. No, we won't, Scott said. I'm not going to stand here arguing. I'm going in. I walked to the door and reached for the knob. I looked back at Scott. The gate clicked open again. Another group entered the yard. All right, Scott grumbled. The back of the house was a warren of storage rooms, connected by a twisting hallway. There was a narrow, uncarpeted stairway leading up. The thumping from a thunderous stereo system beckoned us upward. The people we'd heard behind us caught up. They greeted us in a friendly manner and made no remarks about us being unfamiliar, unexpected, or unwelcome. We let them pass and followed them upstairs. As we entered the third floor, the thudding of the stereo eased into an ethereal blues song, much easier on the ears. Eventually, we discovered that the third floor consisted of two huge rooms. The back half in which we stood as we entered was essentially a kitchen living room area. The track lighting that snaked around the ceiling was turned quite low. The dimness de-emphasized the jungle of gay gothic decor. A new group had come in behind us. After depositing our coats in a pile on a couch in this room, we followed the crowd into the second room. Here, the ceiling and floor were flat black mirrors, completely covered the walls. The only opening in the room was the door through which we entered. A bed, ten feet by ten feet, covered with a black leather spread, set in the middle of the floor. The lighting came from soft white glows concealed in the floor in the four corners. More than thirty men milled about the room, others rapidly entering. No one took particular notice of us. We drifted to a corner, attempting to look at ease and as if we belonged. The other furniture consisted of what you would find in any well-equipped dungeon. A torture rack, shackles and chains, a contraption that somewhat resembled a child's swing, and a table filled with a variety of whips. The men formed a tight circle around the swing. One of them, I thought to be John North, he was dressed in a conservative gray business suit, as were half the others in the room. Some wore jeans and casual shirts. A few were in full leather drag. I don't think I'm going to like this, Scott whispered. Predicting the future is a risky business, I whispered back. From out of the center of the group, a naked male climbed aboard the swing. The men around him murmured with approval. I stifled a gas. For a second, I thought it was Phil. But the swing twirled, and I saw the face clearly. It was a stranger, although he had about the same build as Phil. He was considerably younger. If this kid was over 15, I was over 90. He spread his legs and then reached out over his head to grip the chains. Above, they shackled him by wrist and ankle to swing. We have to put a stop to this, I whispered. At that moment, one of the guests walked up to us. A dozen cows may have died attempting to make him butch. It hadn't worked. His lists and limp wrist showed through the leather. Thick, greasy hair reached to his shoulders. He might have been around 30. He had a pronounced beer gut, the source of which became evident when he breathed on us. Don't I know you, he said to Scott. I don't think so, Scott demurred. 
Well, I think I do, the man stated, assuming the belligerence of a drunkard. Any minute, he would get loud and draw attention to us. He jabbed a finger into Scott's chest. Anybody as pretty as you, I'd never forget. I think you're some movie star. His voice began to rise. One or two of the other gl guests glanced in our direction. With an aplomb that surprised me, I heard Scott said, Maybe you saw me on the cover of one of the national sports magazines. You mean one of those terribly virile magazines for the sweat-drenched set? Sort of, Scott said. Ooh, he crooned. He smiled and put his hand on Scott's hip. And why did they put you on the cover? I pitched no hitters in the World Series. Oh, how wonderful. Is that world thing football or baseball? He scratched his head or hockey. Further explanation became unnecessary when one of the drunk buddies came over and took his arm. Let's go, Edgar, he said. It's time to start. He led Edgar away. That was fairly cool and collected, I said. I practice a lot with reporters, he replied. All eyes were on the swing. Edgar picked up one of the whips. Deep, expectant voices murmured around us. Obviously, we couldn't grab the kid and run. Even if we could get to him, we'd have to unlock his shackles while fending off the mob. If we in some way could yank the boy down undamaged, there were fifty of them, and only two of us. Most of them were far more burly and probably more dangerous than Edgar. I doubted we'd get information from North tonight anyway. Coming back during business hours tomorrow seemed a reasonably sane alternative. I wanted to leave right then, but I couldn't. Not with a 13 or 14 year old ready to be a plaything for what I presumed was tonight's orgy. The one door to the room swung open again. Daphne marched in. Oh shit, I muttered. Let's break for it, Scott urged. I put a restraining hand on his arm. Easy, casual, let's slip over toward the door. They'll be concentrating on center stage. We inched our way around the walls. I figured we could ease out. Get downstairs and make Scott's dream come true. Call the cops. We started in the far corner of the room. From the door, an inch at a time, as casual as possible, we made our way around the fringes of the crowd. We were halfway when I saw Daphne begin to turn her bulk in our direction. I swirled around, hoping to cover us both. I waited breathlessly. Scott peered around my ear carefully. He nodded, jerked his head a quarter inch toward the door. I turned around again. Daphne. Her face turned away from us, chatted amiably with one of the guests. Five minutes later, we were three-quarters of the way to the door. Then, with only a few feet to go, a voice shouted, Hold it, you two! I recognized Daphne's commanding bellow. Grab them! she yelled. We bolted for the door too late. They grabbed us from all sides. We struggled mightily. Scott went down a moment before me, snowed over by the crush of strong arms and bodies. Take them downstairs and keep them secure, Daphne ordered. I saw John North peer over her shoulder. Who are they, he asked. Creeps and fools, she hissed. Get them out of here, she commanded. Roughly and unceremoniously, they shackled us and dragged, carried us downstairs as they escorted us out of the room. I heard one voice. I thought it was Edgar's suggest they use us for the next show on the swing. They secured us to a couple of kitchen chairs in a storeroom on the first floor. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.